Let us start today's session. Uh, again, uh, welcome back everyone uh, for the week two of uh, webinar series on introduction to satellite remote sensing for air quality application. Uh, today we will talk about the visible satellite imageries. So just to give a quick review about uh, we learned about the fundamental of remote sensing, how satellite uh, make measurements, uh, what are the different uh, terminology which we use uh, in satellite remote sensing like orbits, different types of satellites, swath, uh, pixel size, uh, various uh, types of resolution. And those, some of those concepts are very, very important when we use uh, satellite data for a particular application. So that we did cover in week one. Uh, by any chance, if you have missed uh, those, uh, we have recorded version available on our set website, uh, which you can uh, uh, listen at your time and pace. Today, again, we are going to do the satellite imagery, uh, the week two, where we'll learn how we can uh, use the simple visible imagery to learn about some of the air quality features uh, in those images. Uh, outline for the today's sessions are basically we'll look first uh, what are these true and false color images and what we can learn from these images. And then I will also provide tools of uh, two useful image archives. Uh, and if you like to do tour with me, you can follow along with me uh, on those websites. Me. They are pretty easy to follow on and again those who are not there on the first session, my name is uh, Pawan Gupta. I am here at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, I am a research scientist here and uh, do research on aerosol uh, retrieval from satellite observations. So, and here is my contact details. If you need to uh, contact me for any reason, please feel free to call, uh, email me. Uh, we also have uh, uh, Brock Blavin, who is uh, managing this training and he is helping us with the software. So if you have any technical problem or any logistic uh, question, please feel free to email him. His email ID is listed on week one presentation. And thank you, Brock, for helping. So let's uh, start the today's session. Today we will learn about the visual uh, images, science of visual images. Uh, so these visual satellite images are essentially uh, photographs just like what we take from our camera. Uh, these uh, are energy collected by the visual sensors or uh, cameras on board a satellite platform. Uh, and this is light energy which reflect uh, from the objects uh, on the Earth, uh, incoming solar radiation uh, as we learn in the week one presentation that how the sun uh, emits the energy and then it gets reflected back to the space uh, where the satellite is located and it takes, captures that uh, reflected light in different spectral channels. The reflectance is a measure of albedo. So uh, the reflectance which get back to the space uh, is measure of albedo, which is the percentage of light uh, reflected by the Earth's surface or any other surfaces. So we can define the albedo in that manner. Higher the value of albedo or higher the value of reflected radiance, uh, the objects appear more bright in color. Uh, and we are talking about the visual light here. So for example, clouds or snow, uh, they appear very bright in color uh, because they reflect more light back to the space uh, due to their specific optical property and due to the uh, specific wavelength in which they are interacting. Uh, lower the albedo, uh, more it means the more light is absorbed by those specific objects. Uh, so for example, water, uh, if you look at the ocean surface and satellite imagery, you will see it appears dark. As we discussed in last uh, week uh, that the Earth uh, observing remote sensing sensors uh, typically make measurements in many discrete wavelengths. Uh, 
these are called uh, wavelength band or spectral channels or just uh, satellite channels. Here in this picture, uh, you are looking into a electromagnetic spectrum of incoming solar radiation. Mm. Uh, wavelength on the tops are given in meters. Uh, for, for the reference of size of this wavelength, uh, different physical objects are shown here on the uh, bottom of those numbers. Uh, longer the wavelength uh, uh, are mostly radio waves, microwaves, uh, infrareds, and then as we move to the right, uh, we see the visible ultraviolet X-ray, soft X-ray, gamma ray. These are the uh, short wavelengths. Today we are going to focus mostly on the visible part of the solar spectrum, which you can see in the entire spectrum, very very tiny part of the spectrum. Uh, since each uh, wavelength interact with the object very differently, therefore uh, selection of appropriate wavelengths uh, becomes very critical in instrument designing and application. Uh, typically for air quality application, we mostly use uh, visible channels for uh, particulate matter pollutions like aerosols, particles in the atmosphere. Uh, Sometimes we use UV channels and infrared channels to infer other properties. Uh, UV measurement and ultraviolet measurements are usually used to do some of the trace gas pollution, which we'll learn about more on week four. And infrared channels are used to actually detect some of the cloud and fire properties, uh, which we are not going to discuss in this series, uh, but maybe in some another series. Sometimes we use uh, individual channel uh, to extract specific information and other time we use the combination of two or more channels uh, to uh, retrieve specific information or property about an object. So uh, that is why uh, it is really very, very important to understand how this uh, recommended spectrum works and what are the different parts in which we are making measurements so that we can understand the advantage and limitations of that particular measurement. In today's talk, uh, we will focus uh, on visible imagery uh, created using channels in the visible part of solar spectrum. So typically the visible part of solar spectrum ranges from 400 nanometer to 700 nanometer. Uh, and it can be defined a little bit high and low, lower end also, uh, but that's a typical range. So to, to simulate what our human eyes can see, uh, we combine the red channel, uh, the green channel, and the blue satellite uh, uh, channel into corresponding display channel, and as a result, we get a true color image. So in order to simulate what human eye can see, uh, we need these three uh, basic three colors uh, uh, measurement in these three channels red green and blue so to understand little bit more how we create the true color image or rgb uh, here is an example how we create it uh, in this example uh, you have a satellite or eye looking uh, sitting in the space and looking down to earth uh, of a specific area and making the measurement in various different spectral channels, as we discussed uh, in previous slide. So out of this spectral channel, we select uh, red, green, and blue. And if you look here a uh, little bit more, there are uh, wavelengths are also report, reported for the red, green, and the blue. So the red is 600, 671 nanometer, uh, green 5. 51 nanometer, uh, blue is 443 nanometer. Now, these are central wavelength of uh, channels. Uh, as I think we discussed a little bit about that, the bandwidth of the uh, channel in week one. And these are, uh, you will see the number vary a little bit here and there, depending on different instrument. And different. So this is specifically for an instrument called VIRS. Now, if we observe these three images, uh, which are uh, taken into red, green, and blue band, 
then uh, we can identify some of the spectral behavior of the Earth atmosphere system. So the first, uh, if you look the red band, uh, what appears much darker um, actually compared, if you look these features over here, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but this features over here, the darker, uh, that's a water body actually. And, uh, that appears much darker in the red band as compared to the blue band. It, it's much brighter in the blue channels because the water reflects much more light in the blue and uh, it absorbs more light in the red so it appears darker. And on the other hand, uh, the land appears uh, much uh, brighter in the red band compared to the blue band. So if you see the blue, uh, the land appears a little bit darker as compared to the uh, clouds uh, appears more or less uh, similar in all three bands. Uh, there is not much difference in their reflectivity. Uh, of course, uh, it depending on different types of cloud, amount of water vapor, and height, uh, they can have different features. Uh, but uh, in general, they have similar spectral response. Now, if we combine these uh, three bands and come up with a single image, uh, which shows color in the same manner as our human eye can see. So this is a resultant image on the bottom here. Uh, this is a resultant image on the bottom here where you can see things much more clearly and probably it's easier to identify different features in this because this is uh, simulated as our human eye can uh, see. So you can see again the clouds as uh, very bright white thing. Uh, that's how we look from our human eye. You can see water as a dark, uh, land as a brownish uh, color, and then the other features which we'll talk a little bit. So these, uh, this is very, this resulting image is called actually uh, true color image or RGB image. Uh, by visual inspection of these uh, image, uh, we can learn many things uh, about the scene and classify these images into different classes. So we can say, okay, this area is cloud, this is water, this is plain, this is land, this is coastal. Uh, and that really helps in understanding what's going on uh, on that particular scene or uh, on the Earth's surface or in the atmosphere or over the water. So uh, in other words, uh, these true color images provide a visual tool for us to uh, extract some of the information uh, for air quality in, uh, application and in many other applications. Uh, there is uh, one of the most used uh, and popular instrument which uh, provides these true color images is called uh, uh, MODIS. Uh, MODIS stands for mod, mod, Moderate Resolution Imaging Spectral Radiometer. Uh, it is one of the key imaging instruments on NASA's Earth Observing System. Uh, it is designed to measure uh, large-scale global uh, dynamics across land and ocean and the atmosphere. It is flying on the two uh, satellites that uh, allows uh, MODIS to capture imagery of the same area of the Earth. Uh, in different time of the day. Uh, the two instruments are almost identical to each other and both generate daily continuous global uh, images in multiple spectral. So the one mode is fly on the Terra platform uh, which takes measurement in the morning time around 10.30 local solar time. The another is uh, on the MODIS Aqua which fly in the afternoon uh, the data comes from uh, MODIS in HDF format and we'll talk about that a little bit in week 3 and 4. Uh, the spectral coverage varies uh, from uh, uh, visible IR, near IR to mid IR and there are 36 different bands in which it makes measurements. The spatial resolution is also varies depending on which band we are talking about. So it varies from 250 meter resolution to 1 kilometer. There are two bands in which uh, the 250 meter resolutions works. There are five bands 
on which 500 meter spatial resolution is obtained and then the remaining bands obtained at 1 kilometer spatial resolution. And this is a typical one day uh, global coverage of MODIS and what you see here the gaps as we talked in the last week presentation these are the data gaps. Uh, here are some of the more details about specific uh, channels or bands of MODIS and what you have here on the left side are the primary application or the primary use of these channels and also the resolution in which this make measurements. Uh, and what you see here is the bandwidth which I was talking in a few slides uh, early and this bandwidth are basically defined as the width of the band and then when we represent by the single wavelength it's basically center wavelength of this band. Um, I'm just uh, displaying here the primary <coughs> reflectance, reflective bands of the MODIS. The remaining bands are actually in IR channel, uh, which I'm not displaying here for the purpose of uh, just visible imagery. There is uh, another census called VIRS, uh, which is launched in 2010, and it is on board on a NPP, Sumi NPP satellite. Uh, it is uh, a joint mission between NOAA and NASA. Uh, VS is uh, in many ways similar to MODIS, uh, but there are differences as well. One notable difference uh, which we discussed last week as well was the coverage of the SOC week. So if you noticed in the previous slide, uh, MODIS uh, does have orbital gaps or the, the data gaps. But if you look the VS, uh, it does not. Uh, it, it is due to the VIRS uh, larger swath width of about uh, 3000 kilometers uh, compared to what MODIS has is 2330 kilometers. So you don't see those black area uh, between the orbit in the VIRS image and that's the added advantage of VIRS on uh, MODIS. Now, if you understand the physics of how a particular wavelength interact with the object on the earth or in the atmosphere or the over ocean, uh, we can create images uh, which uh, to emphasize certain features. Uh, so in the visible imagery uh, or the trucular imagery, uh, the water appears dark as it absorbs more energy. Uh, clouds appear white as it reflects more solar energy incoming solar energy and then the pollution or the haze or smoke uh, up, uh, the color actually will depends on its absorbing property. In this particular uh, image uh, we know that this is uh, uh, fires burning in off of the coast of the Georgia and Florida in, in the United States is putting out a lot of this smoke which is mixing with the clouds and other weather pattern and transporting in the area. So depending on where and how thick the smoke is, the color will change. So this, in this particular case, this is the smoke. Uh, glint is uh, another very important uh, feature in satellite imagery, uh, which is unavoidable uh, over the ocean. Uh, if you look enough satellite images, then identifying glint by the naked eye is not uh, very difficult. Uh, it's that bright uh, area in the middle of the uh, image uh, uh, over the ocean which is typically you see. So in, the, in this image if you look this uh, very bright surface, bright area in the middle of the image uh, circled by this red circle, this is called glint. Uh, sun, sun glint is a uh, phenomenon that occurs when the sun reflects of the surface of the ocean uh, at the same angle that satellite or the sensor is making measurement or viewing the surface. So when the sun angle and the satellite angles matches uh, over the ocean, you will see features like that. In the reflected area, the image, uh, uh, the smooth over water, uh, very you will see very smooth feature over water, uh, becomes very mirror type of uh, features. Uh, while rough areas uh, which you can see some of that uh, becomes very dark. 
So depending on the smoothness of ocean surface, uh, you can see very bright or very dark uh, uh, features on inside the sun plate. Sometimes the sun glints regions of satellite uh, image reveals uh, interesting oceans or atmosphere features uh, that sensor does not typically record. Uh, for air quality purpose, it is mostly not useful as uh, the signal dominates uh, by this glint and it's very, very hard to separate it from the atmospheric signal. So this is important. Another restriction of using satellite data over ocean is that wherever there is a glint, we will not uh, see uh, satellite data retrieval uh, specifically for aerosols. Uh, clouds, uh, there are other features uh, in the atmosphere which we can identify. Uh, clouds are, like we said, are white and gray uh, and they tend to have textures. So if you look the clouds in any satellite image, you will see some kind of a texture. So there are clouds on the top of the image here. So if you look the top of the image, there are clouds over the uh, Himalayan mountain and beyond that area. Uh, haze uh, is usually uh, featureless and uh, gray in color or dim white. Uh, dense haze is more opaque, so you can see some dense haze over here in the northeast part of the India and Bangladesh. And the thinner haze is more transparent, which you can see in the northern India over here. Uh, the color of smoke or haze usually reflects uh, the amount of uh, moisture and the chemical pollutants, uh, so it depends on the, their absorbing or reflecting properties. Uh, but it is not always possible to tell that the difference between haze and fog uh, in visual interpretation of satellite imagery. Sometimes uh, we can get confused uh, because they have very similar spectral signature. Uh, what you see here is in this image is very smooth uh, white features. Uh, these are natural fog. Uh, but it may be also mixed with the pollution. So this very nice features, it most likely a natural fog mixed with the pollution or sometimes they can be very low clouds uh, which can appear as a fog. So th there are many different interesting features uh, which you can observe uh, in uh, any specific true color image and can help you identify uh, different seen uh, in any visible satellite imagery. There are more examples here. Uh, volcanic plumes uh, uh, over Indonesia on the top right panel here. Uh, they appear uh, depending on the eruptions. Uh, uh, plumes of steams of gas are white, uh, for example, in this case. Uh, ace plumes are brown, uh, suspended uh, Volcanic ash is also brown. Uh, so depending on uh, what kind of chemical composition is emitting for different volcanoes, because some volcanoes are uh, sulfate rich, uh, some are CO2 rich, some of them are producing more ash. So depending on what they are emitting, you will see different color in the visible satellite image. The the bottom right panel it shows a uh, very dark features. This is a uh, fire uh, on the Indian oil. It was, I think, 2009 and close to Jaipur city. Uh, they had a big fire in the oil depot. And they, that put out a lot of smoke in the area. Uh, since it was very uh, oil fire, so it produced a lot of black carbon. So you can see the thick black plume of those fires. So this is smoke, but the color shows tell us me that it's not typical vegetation fire. It, uh, it is, has a high carbon content. Uh, the other examples are uh, dust over Australia, uh, the urban or industrial pollution over Bangladesh and over India. Uh, so by looking these satellite imageries over time and over time, you start getting a good feeling about different features in these images. Uh, you can identify by their shape, uh, textures, or by their color. Uh, uh, another example set of images uh, uh, 
Uh, on top, you have a, a Saharan dust, which is looking brown. Uh, and what you can see is that the, uh, the contrast of the dust when it goes off the uh, over the ocean, then you can clearly see is because of the dark background uh, of ocean. But if you see the same dust over land, then it is difficult to separate between land and dust because the underlying surface is also very bright and on top of that dust, dust is very bright. So to identify dust over land, probably we need to use different bands or more spectral channels uh, so that we can separate these two signals. Uh, another example of wildfires uh, off the coast of California. Uh, where you see a lot of fires burning and they are putting very thick plume of smoke which is uh, with the wind uh, transporting over the ocean and you can see very nice uh, smoke plumes uh, with different colors uh, based on their uh, opacity. Again, there's some industrial pollutions of the northeast of US here uh, and the smoke pollution over the Atlantic. Uh, another example of fires in Alaska uh, they are putting out some smoke. So again, depending on what what is your interest, uh, different features will look different in the visual images uh, and will be helpful. Okay, so before going uh, forward, uh, I have a uh, very quick cues uh, where we can identify some of those features. Uh, in the satellite imagery. So I have a composite uh, imagery of the over the United States and I have numbered some of the specific areas 1 to 8 in the image and basically you need to identify what each of these uh, surface uh, or the features of that image are. Uh, you can say either the cloud, has land, water, plane, whatever. So I will just give you a minute to look around this image and then I have three uh, poll questions uh, looking at uh, haze cloud and sun gleam. So if you can just uh, uh, respond to them very quickly uh, then we can, we can move forward. Okay, so uh, I think let's move on so that we can cover other things. So uh, I think most people have answered it correctly, but I'll show you the uh, answer here quickly. So if you look the next image, there are answers. So you see sun glint uh, over off the coast of the California, the bright surface which we talked about, and you can see the same feature over ocean on the, excuse me on the east coast. You can see some smoke, clouds are visible uh, in many different places. Uh, you can see some haze which is transporting actually and there are some snow in the northern latitude. So these are some of the important things uh, which we can uh, learn from these images. Now before I move forward, I would like to go ahead and do a quick uh, tour to a website uh, uh, where you can find those interesting images uh, because I have shown some of the good images here where you can look this different uh, uh, really beautiful features of Earth atmosphere system. So where to look for this? So for that uh, I will uh, share uh, and you can start your uh, browser if you would like to follow along with me. Okay, so uh, there is a website called Earth Observatory. So if you uh, if you open the any search engine, uh, you just type uh, NASA Earth Observatory, and then the first link which you see is Earth Observatory NASA.gov. That's where we want to look. And if you open the site, uh, you will see a, a image of the day. So uh, Earth Observatory folks actually uh, provide image of the day which is interesting to the different people. 
But before going to that, I would like to go bottom of the page and there is a link called about, about the Earth Observatory. And this basically gives you a very nice uh, uh, overview of what Earth Observatory is. So I am going to read the mission statement. The Earth Observatory mission is to share with public the images, stories and discoveries about the environment, earth system and climate that emerge from NASA research, including its satellite missions, in-field research experiment and the models. So basically it is a public platform where people can find interesting images and then you can find other all the details about who are involved and other things. So let us go back to the home and you see image of the day. Uh, you can also see some of the features here and you can click uh, on these different uh, this arrow to get to different images. If you go a little bit more then you will see natural hazard where you will see uh, events like dust storm, typhoon or thunderstorm or uh, volcano or smoke or fire or that kind of thing. Uh, if you go a little bit more on the global maps, then you will see the maps of, uh, let me click on the global maps here. So this is a kind of an archive uh, of global maps of different uh, uh, at land atmosphere features. So for example, aerosol optical depth is one of the parameters which we will learn more Next week you can find the monthly map and these are in movie format so you can play and see how things are happening from the March 2000 to uh, May 2016 so usually they, they keep it correct within one or two months. And then you can read about it uh, what we are trying to show here. Uh, similarly you can see other parameters, uh, the aerosol size, fire, you can look that this is a very interesting thing. Um, so you can play this how different parts of the world are having fire in different season uh, depending on the weather pattern and other uh, practices in that particular region. So this is, I, I like, I specifically like because this gives me a quick global view of uh, different uh, uh, earth atmosphere parameters which I am interested in. So you can see vegetation, uh, rainfall, snow cover, water vapor, sea surface temperature and they keep adding new parameters as they become available. Now you can click on the images and then again you will see very different types of images. So you will see heat, land, uh, snow, water, life. So they are classified into different categories. and. Uh, so this is like for example very interesting. So they do not only provide image from the satellite but from the uh, photographs taken by the astronaut. So this is a photographs taken by astronaut uh, from the International Space Station and it is showing the city of uh, Paris in the night time. So very interesting and you can see related images here on the right side. You can see some of the features. Uh, articles from the field campaign, from the long term studies, from the research. Uh, you have here on the calendars, you can browse by different years, you can browse by different topics. Uh, this is the news and notes. And if you do not find what you are looking, you can also search. So one of the thing I would like to show is the story. Uh, they have done is called uh, tracking the dust of over the Atlantic. So this is uh, uh, a study done in uh, August 2013 and this is event which lasted several days. So you have Africa uh, which uh, Saharan dust put out a lot of dust over ocean and with the weather system this dust actually transport all the way to the United States. So this is the first image. And if you look these image in time series, then you can actually see how the dust plume is transporting. So this is July 31st. August 1st, you can see it expanded to much bigger area. And if you look 
August 2nd, then it almost reached to the South America and some of the Caribbean islands. You can see same thing with some more uh, more quantitative parameters called aerosols. So this is a from another census called OMS, which provide aerosol index similar to OMS, which we'll talk next week actually. But what you see this uh, are the aerosol concentration. So the uh, yellow color is low aerosol and the red is more aerosol. So you can see the smoke plume is the dust plume is originating over Sahara on the day 1 of July 31st, it's transporting in the Atlantic. It extends uh, on August 1st. And August 2, it reaches to some of the part of the uh, South American Caribbean. And if you keep looking, then you will see that it reaches all the way to the Central America and uh, some part of the Florida and other parts. So this is uh, interesting. And you, this is a complete view. So you can find such uh, very nice case studies in the Earth observation. And we'll see this from another uh, another uh, archive uh, where you can see uh, analyze the similar things for in near real time. So with that, uh, I will go back to the presentation. And uh, we'll continue our presentation, and then uh, I will show you another tool uh, towards the end. So that was an uh, tools to the Earth Observatory. Uh, again, all the links are there on this PPT uh, towards the end. So if you want to access it at a later point, and you want to learn, that's very, uh, very, very interesting. I always like to go that uh, website to find different interesting features. Okay, let's move on. So I was showing an example of uh, using time series uh, in Earth Observatory. So we looked uh, images uh, for different days to track how dust is moving from uh, source to different part of the world. Okay. Uh, here is another example where uh, dust is originating in uh, in Arabian Peninsula. And again, like I was talking earlier, we have two modis sensors, one on Terra, which is about 10.30 a.m., and then Aqua. So we can look actually the same thing uh, using two different time in the same day. So this is April 6, 2013, and this is morning time, uh, and the bottom is the afternoon time. And I would like you to pay attention in the region where we have the circle. So if you look the top panel on inside the circle, you will see some uh, hazy, some uh, brownish thing, which is actually dust. But it, since it's over land and the surface and the dust color is similar, it's very hard to identify it. And on the bottom, you can say same thing, but there is a uh, data gap here due to the orbital gap of the Mori sensor. Now let's look this same area. Uh, in the another date. So this is April 6, this is April 7. Uh, you see that dust has actually moved all the way and it has it's covering a lot more area. And if you look very carefully, uh, in the morning time around 10.30, you see a layer of uh, dust along the coast, which is much more uh, easily visible in the satellite imagery because the background is very dark water bodies. And if you see three hours later around 1.30, you can see that it has extended further. So you see much larger area. So it clearly demonstrates that the over time, the dust storm is moving towards uh, Arabian Sea. Uh, and you can track that using the satellite. So now if you go to the next day, this is August, uh, April 8. And then you can see the dust is actually covering most of the Arabian Sea and reaching to the uh, other regions, Pakistan and India. And in, in the afternoon, you see the extent. It has uh, uh, increased the extent. Also, what one other thing you can notice in these two images is that in the morning time, the dust is concentrated in a smaller area, so it's much more thicker. Uh, in the afternoon, it has extended to the larger area, so it has become thinner in density. So these are some of the interesting features which we can just uh, look in the visible satellite image identify. Okay, now we have talked enough about uh, the true color images. 
uh, but these are not the only images uh, we can also have false color images so false color images are to enhance uh, particular features we want to see in image uh, so we load the band into red green and blue display channel that do not correspond to the visible red green and blue wavelength so instead of loading uh, red, green, and blue, we choose different channels. So in this case, uh, we have a Landsat image here. And instead of uh, RGB, red, green, blue channel, we decided to use a 1.6 micron, 1.2 micron, and 2.1 micron channel, which are loaded in the same RGB channels uh, in the display system. And this is a little bit more computer science uh, uh, thing how we load this in a display but if you there are software which can do you do for these things for you or you can write out your own computer software to do that. Uh, so what you see here are some of the nice land features uh, there is uh, pay attention to this uh, magenta or pink area on the uh, top left area of the image and then you can see nice some land uh, CD type images and then vegetation and then some River type features. Now, if I do the same image uh, by true color image, so I also have on the left is true color image of the same scene where I loaded uh, red in the uh, red channel, green in the green channel, blue in the blue channel. So, what I see is the smoke plume coming from these fires which are happening here, and this is the, exactly the same region in this. But in the true color image, I cannot identify a lot of things. Uh, but if I do the false color image, what you see here is, you can see some trace of a smoke in the false color image. But since a smoke particles are smaller or the fine in size, uh, they are not visible, very well visible in the longer wavelength. Because we are using 1.6, 1.2 and 2.1 micron channel. Uh, where their signal is very low and that's the reason you don't see those smoke plume and in this channel the smoke appears as a transparent and you can see features underneath that smoke plume which is not possible in the true color image. So these are the advantage of having false color image. You can see certain things uh, which are not possible in the true color images. So again it Reemphasize the importance of selecting uh, wavelength and understanding in which wavelength the satellite is making measurement. Uh, and this is a nice example of that. And you can find a lot of false color images uh, actually on Earth Observatory, and I will show you another tool where you can find uh, do these kind of images more. Uh, here is another very good uh, example of uh, true color images and this is really uh, a phenomenal example. Uh, if, if you are in the United States, uh, in Europe, part of the Europe, uh, we have something called fall color where the tree changes their colors, they become really yellow, orange, red in different colors. And I think in many other parts of the world it happens uh, depending on the vegetation type and the climate. Uh, but the interesting thing is, can we see that from the satellite, from the space? So, this is pictures uh, taken over a uh, forest covering the Great Smoky Mountain in the southeastern United States, uh, which changes color from brown to green uh, to orange to brown uh, in different seasons. So, on the top, uh, what you see so let's just start with the bottom right panel which is summer and in summer you have a lot of vegetations uh, all the uh, all the mountains are covered with the vegetation so you see nice green pictures like this as you move from summer to fall season when uh, trees start changing the color and leaves start falling uh, you see a very brownish color where you have mixture of different colors which makes this shape. So the fall looks very colorful in the in that part of the world. From fall to winter when there is a high, uh, low temperature all of the uh, most of the uh, 
leaves from the vegetation fell down and you can see underlying surface. So you see very rough land type of features. Uh, in the springtime, uh, bottom left here, uh, temperatures start uh, increasing and then the vegetation start uh, blooming and you see uh, actually uh, the leaves coming, start coming back. So you see some features which is greenish, combination of greenish and brownish. So some of the land, some of the uh, trees have uh, vegetation, uh, leaves, some of them does not. So you see a mixture of green and brown. And again, in the summer, it becomes green. So this is really powerful tool to observe things which we cannot think about seeing that from seven, eight hundred kilometers from the in the space, in which you can really see in the satellite. Event. And this can be very useful in monitoring this kind of features around the world, learning about different type of vegetation, and for just for fun purpose, it's really interesting. Uh, this is a uh, article uh, on the Earth Observatory. If you want to learn a little bit more about this feature identification, uh, uh, the, there is also article on this fall color images uh, on the Earth Observatory, which you can find using this link here. So this is in your time. If you want to le learn more, uh, I would highly recommend to go through this page. page. Uh, here is the list of uh, several uh, web page uh, which uh, we usually recommend for people to get uh, uh, satellite imageries uh, and there are different uh, ones. Uh, and in the end, uh, we already talked about the Earth Observatory. Uh, I would like to give you a tour of another uh, website called uh, NASA Worldview which provides near real-time access of satellite imagery and many other uh, parameters. So to do that, uh, I'm going to share back a, my screen. And again, if you would like to, if you would like to follow along with me, uh, please uh, open your browser uh, and then we will move on. Okay, so I will go back to Google. Um, I usually don't remember the URL, so I just use Google to. So uh, I will type NASA World View. And if I ta type NASA World View, the first result shows worldview.earthdata.nasa.com. That's where I will click. And if you click on that, uh, you will see a page like this. Uh, where you have a welcome window which says take a tour or skip the tour. So if you are already using this, you can skip. But if you are first time users, I would highly recommend take a tour because when you take this tour, it will tell you what these different buttons or clicks you can do in this tool. So I, I'll just go through very quickly, walk you through what this is. So the timeline, on the bottom, you have a timeline. You can select, and you can change the date by going by arrow, you can type, you can use this arrow going back and forth, uh, or you can click on any of this area here to go jump to that particular line. Uh, there is a days, month window here, you can click on any of that, and it will take you to that scale. So this is a timeline with where you can select which state you are interested in. Uh, you have timelines continues, and then, then you have a layer. So uh, there are two types of layers. Base layer. Uh, base layer is basically the background layer which you want to display. And there are three options in base layer. You can either have a viewer's uh, reflectance or the true color image, you can have modis aqua true color image, or you can have a terra modis uh, true color image. So you can select that which one you want. Then you can uh, pick the layers here, so overlaying layers. So there are some basic layers like coastlines, you can click that. Uh, you can click on the uh, places names. As soon as you activate this layer, you will see start seeing some of the names. Uh, and if you, you can click on this I button again, the, those, uh, the cross sign says it's not active. 
and if you click again it will come back so if there is a cross on the eye it means not active if it is there is no cross then it means active and then you can click on this borders to show some country and other kind of uh, features okay now if you go to the next uh, here are some of the maps which you can use uh, uh, the toolbar has some of the things like uh, uh, you can get a link to the display which you are looking right now so if you click on this thing it will give you a link of the current display and you can share with your friends uh, 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 within agency or anybody else you can put it online and this is a permanent link so if you take it now uh, 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 it's supposed it's not uh, supposed to expire uh, you can if you click on the camera you can take a snapshot of area so as soon as you click on that you can go to a specific area make a box and then you can uh, save the image in different special resolution uh, in different format jpeg png geotiff or kmz kmz is for google earth gis geotiff is for people who wants to use in arcgis format uh, you can choose that. Uh, there is an information tab where you can learn a little bit more about source and other kind of things and if you have problem you can send it back to them. So this is a very uh, quick tour. So let me go to uh, here on the panel on the left side. So you have uh, the active and if I click on the add layer then it comes up with this dialog box. And what you see here on the dialog box is different features. Uh, they are categorized air quality, ash plumes, fires, dust, drought, flood, severe storm, shipping, vegetation, and there are many others. I think there are more than 500 or 600 different parameters which you can actually display here. And if you don't know where which parameter you're looking, you can search here. So for example, I can search for aerosols. And then all the parameters related to the aerosols are display here which I can display and I can click on the box on the right side and then it will start coming up on the map like this. So I would like to go back uh, uh, of that dust transport which we just looked on the earth observatory and see it if we can uh, uh, visualize that. So to do that uh, let me let me close all of these and then first go to the uh, date on which I want to go back. Okay. So that was from 2013. So I click here and go to 2013 and then that was the starting in July. So I will, I'm already on July and then let's start somewhere around 28 uh, July. Okay, so this is 28 July and we are looking into this area. Okay, uh, pay attention to uh, this zoomed in area of the coast of Africa. Okay, and we are looking uh, more as uh, aqua images. So let's, let me go back and see. So on 28 July, you don't see much activity in terms of the dust over ocean. You see a plane, you see a data gap. Now let's change the date. So if I click this arrow on the bottom, I go back to the next day. Now you see, so 28, 29, you see it starts seeing some uh, brownish shade over ocean that's just coming from the Saharan Desert. Uh, I can click on that and then you will see progression of the transport of the dust as we move along on the, uh, 31st you can see much more extended this nice features of dust which is going along with the uh, weather pattern system and then again you see how extended it has uh, over the time on the first or the second you see it has reached all the way here and now things are looking much thinner but you can see some features some hazy type features over the uh, Central America and over uh, uh, Southern America. Now you don't see any 
dust here in this region on August 4, but you see some over uh, Central, uh, Central American, uh, America, uh, Southern America region. Now, how do we know this is dust or not? So one is that we look this satellite visual image region by training, we know that, okay, these are dust. But there are other ways to do that. So let me bring some other uh, features which can tell us some of the, so I will go to the dust, the storm, and then there are three parameters called aerosol optical depth. So I'm looking aqua uh, mode satellite. So I will click on the aerosol optical depth, which will tell me. And then I will also uh, capture another parameter, which we will talk next week. But I just want to give you a brief uh, 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 example of how it can be used. It's called angstrom exponent over ocean. So I will take that. So as soon as I pick them, they appear here on the layers window and in, in the order in which I pick them. And if I click on this, I can actually move their order. So, and as you see, well, as soon as I move them in order, their uh, display on the panel is also changed. So let's go back to the, I'm going to deactivate these two layers and just have visual image. So we don't see any visible image. Now I will put aerosol optical depth. This is an indicator of how much aerosols in the atmosphere. And we'll learn about that more in next week. So you see some high values of aerosol optical depth, OK, here in this part. Uh, again, we can move June 29 when we have seen the layer uh, dust, uh, dust transporting uh, July. 31st, due to some reason we don't have that retrieval, uh, July 31st, you can see very high values of aerosol optical depth in the region where we have dust. Uh, this is August 1st, again the dust is transporting, and this is August 2nd, again you can see nice plume of dust, and these data gaps actually can be problematic, so you have this uh, gap due to the clean and due to the orbital gap. Satellite. And on August 3rd, it has transported all the way to here on the uh, west side, August 4, August 5, and likewise. So you can see that. So that's another indicator of there is some aerosol uh, features going on. But uh, this component which I was talking is called uh, aerosol ex and, uh, angstrom exponent. And this basically tells me uh, about the size of the particle. So uh, if angstrom coefficient values are larger than 1, they are typically small size particle like a smoke and other things. Uh, if their size is, if their size, uh, if the angstrom exponent value is less than 1, uh, then they are telling me they are a larger size particle. So if you see these values, they are about less than 0.5 or maybe lesser and you can see some of the colors changing. Uh, this color is actually uh, even lower, less than 0.15 or something like that. And this is uh, indicator of dust. Again, uh, you can flip through different days and you will see that dust is showing low values of angstrom coefficients suggesting these are some coarse size particle and looking by knowing the source and area, you can say uh, this is uh, most likely dust. Uh, you can, there are another features here. Uh, if you click on this uh, panel which uh, has an arrow and a, it's a download button. So you, as soon as you click on that, you will see satellite orbit and then uh, you can click on this one sort and then it will start displaying granules of MODIS and we'll learn about that. And as soon as I select that, first I have to select which layer I want to. So for example, aerosol optical depth, I go back here, I select this and then it, it's, uh, I can say select, download selected data and then I will find the list of the data. I can directly download the MODIS uh, uh, HDF file, which we'll learn more next week. Uh, I can search on the website, and there are other tools uh, uh, for your help. And I think uh, that's all I have. Uh, let me go back to the presentation here. Uh,
so again the link is here if you forget it uh, please make use again uh, like last week uh, there is no assignment for this week uh, next week we will talk about uh, aerosols uh, specifically uh, remote sensing of aerosols some of the NASA products and how we can connect them with the surface level PM2.5 and just reminder all the materials and recordings will be available through this web link uh, and here is my contact information for any technical question if you have other uh, issues with material access trainings and other logistics uh, please uh, contact uh, Brock Blavin uh, who is our training coordinator and he will be happy to uh, uh, help you in any way we can uh, with that, thank you and I will be happy to take any questions uh, for next 10 minutes or so. Thank you very much. Okay, so there is the question which sensor was used on the image shown on slide PP22. Uh, okay, uh, those were referring to the false color image uh, showing some of the smoke plume from the fire. Uh, those are very high resolution image and they comes from uh, uh, Landsat satellite which is a land mapping sensor uh, and so those images were from the Landsat. Okay. Sorry. Oh, oops. How can blink be corrected from any images for its analytical purpose? Uh, we can correct glint up to some extent, uh, but it will depend on what features uh, you are trying to extract. Uh, for air quality purpose and specifically for aerosols, uh, it's very, very hard to correct it. Uh, so uh, whenever there is a glint, uh, we actually mask that data and we do not use for aerosol retrieval. Uh, but depending on the sol sun solar geometry, uh, sun satellite geometry, you can calculate actually the impact of glint on each pixel. Okay, let me see what are other questions here. Uh, will the sun glint area act more like a camera aperture and reflect the surface uh, activity of the sun? Well, it's not about the surf, uh, surface activity of the sun. Uh, it's the angle in which uh, uh, sun is uh, uh, putting out the solar radiation and the satellite is looking. So when you have, a, uh, they both are in the same angles, uh, although they are looking in a different direction, but in the same angle. So it's called a specular reflection. It's a physics terminology. So when you have a, a specular reflection, you see this very bright uh, reflectivity, very bright reflectivity, and it's very hard to see other features in that. World view and model. I already did this step before, but the problem is that the data in HDF form, how can it be used in GIS software? Okay, so if you noticed uh, when I showed you a download uh, camera button, if you pick a specific area and you want to use that image in a GIS format, then uh, you can actually download in uh, GeoTIFF format. And GeoTIFF is uh, accessible through any GIS format. Uh, but there are, I understand there are some other data sets which might be in HDF format. So there are ways to, uh, nowadays new GIS softwares handle the HDF data like ArcGIS can handle HDF data. Okay. Uh, if there are too many clouds in certain region, how do we detect fires? Okay, so if there are a lot of clouds, one thing we can do about the fire is to uh, use the infrared channel. 
uh, and by looking uh, different in the temperature because if there is a fire you, it, you will see high temperature in that region and that can be an indicator of fire and then can separate from the cloud and uh, fire. That's one uh, option but there are other options when, where you look the different spectral signature of smoke and uh, cloud which uh, and you can use the to separate them. How can you identify snow and clouds and satellite images because both appear white? Okay, uh, yes, it's true that both appears white, uh, but uh, in general, uh, uh, fresh snow or, or long-term snow or ice have very high reflectivity, even higher than clouds. So usually they are much more brighter than clouds, but sometimes I can understand they have similar reflectivity. So then you start looking the temperature is another uh, handy things to look because snow ice will have very cold temperature whereas clouds will might not have that cold temperature. Uh, other information we can look about some of the height information. Uh, then we also look about their textures uh, because if you see the snow and ice, uh, the clouds look very smooth. Uh, snow ice will have some kind of a texture so we can identify can use those different uh, tools, spatial and spectral variability in these features to identify or separate them. Okay. Uh, are we able to identify small fire using MODIS? Uh, okay. So small is uh, relative terms. Uh, MODIS uh, channels uh, which uh, detect fires uh, are at one kilometer spatial resolution so anything below that if, if very small fire like a dumb fire probably not but if it is large enough to have enough signal then yes. How do false color images allow you to see through clouds or haze? So false color images means you can choose any channel you want. So for example, if you have very infrared channel uh, which does not reflect, uh, uh, which does not uh, see any reflection from this tiny smoke particles or haze particle, then you can use that because for that specific wavelength smoke is more transparent because the wavelength is very larger as compared to the size of the particles, so it does not really see the haze. For clouds, it becomes more difficult because cloud uh, does respond to longer spectral bandwidth and it can become a challenge. But then you use other uh, tools like temperature to identify those features. Is it possible to get glint free images if you want? Uh, on research basis, yes, but uh, we don't have any tools or data sets which can readily make those available. Okay, there is a question, can we import the data from Worldview into ArcGIS? Uh, again, I would say you have to download the data in either GOT format which can be read in the ArcGIS. Uh, there is no direct uh, import options from Worldview to ArcGIS. 